Well, hi, friends. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon, this lovely day and the end of November. Our topic today, being led by David Miller, is on measuring and managing and optimizing plants and crops, thinking about next season's performance rather than just this season's performance. This is a very important topic because it's very common in the approach that we take to plant nutrition when we think about using plant sap analysis to think of this as managing this year's crop performance. But we actually can have a tremendous impact when we think about how does this data and this information help us shift and change for next year's crop performance. So we have a really great panel here today. Uh, David Miller has been um, kind enough to lead this conversation with some of the growers that we have worked with here at AEA. And we're going to have lots of fun. If you have any questions at any point for uh, anyone on the panel or just general questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box. David is going to be monitoring that. And um, we're just going to have a fun conversation learning from all of our experiences and how we can improve and do things better. So thank you for being here. I'm sure you'll find the information very valuable and useful. And David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, John. And welcome to everyone on the call here. It's a delight to be connecting with farmer friends, people who are producing food, which has been largely the reason that I've been with John for the last 10 years and, and just really passionate about the food we grow and, and the value that and, and the influence that all of you have on um, the well-being of the people consuming the food. So want to um, thank Joel and Zach and Steve who are with us here today to share their story, share the things that um, they look at when they're measuring success, measuring even failures from this past year and, and how that helps them plan for the next year. So um, thank you to all of you for coming and we invite all of you, um, the audience here, to just put your <clears throat> questions in the Q&A, and those questions can be for the whole panel. Um, so we're looking forward to having a conversation. We'll just kick it off by um, a quick introduction from each of you panelists. Maybe we'll go by alphabetical order and have Joel, Steve, and then Zach just um, give a quick introduction of yourself, a little bit of your operation, what you grow, and, and some of the goals that you have. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel Grossbach. Uh, I live and farm in southwest Nebraska. We are on the high plains in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we get about 18 to 19 inches of rain every year. We have sandy to silt loam soils. Um, we have both irrigated and dry land crop ground and systems. Um, and we also have uh, native pasture. My father runs a, a beef cow-calf operation on that ground as well. Um, I would say historically our major crop has been corn, um, although we are certainly looking to diversify that cropping system. So we include soybeans, grain sorghum, wheat, oats, millet, and I think the primary crops that, you know, that have really driven our regenerative uh, journey here are popcorn and dry edible beans um, as we're looking for a better way to raise those those crops so that they're um, simply healthier and of a higher quality because they are our human food crops. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Joel. Go ahead, Steve. Well, hi, everybody. David, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I, have to, I have to admit it's a little intimidating to be on the same call with John Kemp. I, I look forward to meeting you guys someday, but my name is uh, Steve Cockroft. My wife and family and I, we own and operate <clears throat> Croft Family Farm just outside of Greeley, Colorado, so uh, we're not uh, probably that far away, Joel. I didn't realize you were in, in uh, southwest Nebraska, but we have uh, 20 acres that we grow a wide variety of vegetables on, and we also have chickens on pasture for egg production. Um, one of our main goals at the farm and, and our big desire is to connect people with real food. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Go ahead, Zach. 
All right, I am Zach Mayer. I am from Grand Island, Nebraska, which is in the central part of the state. Uh, we are all irrigated, mostly by pivot irrigation, some uh, by gravity irrigation, a little bit of subsurface drip irrigation. Uh, we are all commodities on our farm, uh, what I would call just raw commodities. Uh, our, the, my standard rotation would be uh, soybeans uh, and then to rye uh, that I raised for seed, milo and corn. Milo is relatively new to me the last couple of years. Uh, I'm looking to diversify uh, even further. Uh, I'm a fourth generation family farm that uh, was a couple of thousand acres. And since then, my cousin and my brother and I have kind of split off and are very amicable. We're all just, they wanted to go back to what was conventional agriculture. Uh, I kept my eight or 900 acres and then continuing down this path of regenerative ag, I would like to actually add in a real food production of some sort, whether it be berries or uh, I'm already into the uh, cow calf uh, uh, farm to table in the beef world uh, in a small way, uh, 30 or 40 uh, pairs. Uh, so I guess my goal moving forward would be to continue this. I wanna get into more actual food production and out of commodity production. Great, thank you. Thank you. And maybe we'll just um, kind of have you continue, Zach, with um, the story of how you, how did you get started on um, regenerative practices and is it that, that you have seen thus far? So how did you start? What, ha, what are you seeing thus far that um, gives you the hope or the, the in, uh, intent to continue with that? Right. So I went to no-till on the plains many years ago, 10, 12, 15. I don't even know what it was. And uh, uh, I have been every year since, but, you know, from Dave Brandt to uh, Rick Bieber to, uh, uh, I just can't, the Dwayne Beck, you name it, uh, Gabe Brown, that was kind of where my introduction into what wasn't regenerative ag at the time, but was basically the world of no-till and uh, so that was kind of my beginnings. Uh, I was hook, line, and sinker from the get-go. Uh, some super brilliant people with super sharp minds doing different things. Uh, so that is kind of how I started, and that's uh, kind of where I'm moving. Great. Excellent. And what about you, Steve? Well, we've... Um... We've been using organic fertilizers and farming in a regenerative way for, oh, about 12 years now. But really, that way of thinking got planted in our minds, you know, more than 30 years ago. <clears throat> my, uh, my oldest son, Jason, he's 31, and <clears throat> he's a special needs autistic kid. And 25, 30 years ago, as we were in that journey of trying to figure out, you know, what's wrong with this kid? What are his needs? What, how can we help him? And we found that diet and nutrition were some of the biggest things that either affected him very positively or very negatively. So in that, that journey, that changed us. You know, we farmed for years with relatives and my uncle farmed conventionally. And, you know, you, you just, you grew up spraying glyphosate, spraying 2,4-D. That was just how we, how we grew up and didn't think anything of it. Well, my son's condition changed how we viewed food, realizing that food mattered and what you put in your mouth mattered and the purity of the food matter and the freshness of the food mattered. And so all of this began us on a journey um, that basically started with our, our trying to help our son that led us to this place. So because of his challenges, when the opportunity to farm our own ground presented itself in 2010, we already knew that we were going to be growing in a pure and organic way. Mm -hmm. Great. Wow. Nothing more powerful than uh, having experiences like that, that just <laughs> teach us the effects of what we eat is what we are. My, my yep. story, story of how I got started with this is very similar to that of, of a health crisis changing that. Yeah. 
Great. Joel, what's your story and what, uh, what started you down this path? I, I think I have to credit my father. Um, even 25, 30 years ago, he was starting to see weaknesses in the system. And so even, even back then, we, we transitioned over into no-till, which was sort of a new thing because we got tired of watching the dirt blow. And so we, we could already start this thinking that if we can identify problems and maybe it's part of our system. And so we maybe don't change very fast, but um, we've, we've always tried to look one step ahead and, and identify those weaknesses in our system. Um, but really in 2017, I had an opportunity to raise some organic crops. And I went into that really not having an, any idea what I was doing. Uh, especially coming from a conventional fertilizer and chemical world. Um, and so I went hunting for all kinds of information and knowledge and um, of all the people out there and all the good information that you can glean from it. Um, probably two really key points that I learned in that experience uh, was that you know, healthy plants will be resistant to insects and diseases. And a lot of the conventional way of fertilizing and raising crops actually contributed to those problems that we're, that we're trying to avoid or to solve. And so even though I'm not doing any organic production today, it almost became a matter of conscience that, well, I just can't go back to the way I was doing things before. Mm -hmm. And especially when we consider the the, the popcorn and the, and the edible beans, that's a human food crop. Uh, and, and I wanna make sure that that is done well. And those two crops traditionally are very heavily reliant on, on chemical inputs. And so, like I say, it became almost a matter of conscience that I just can't return to the way I was doing things and I've got to develop a better way. And so, so now this is expanding to the really the whole farm. And how does this look as a big picture with, with rotations and, inputs and livestock and whatever crops we raise. So. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Thanks to your dad seeing, seeing that that long ago, it's, it's powerful to think what that means for the, the choices we make today for our sons, <laughs> all things do make a big difference. Yeah. Um, so as the title suggests, we, you know, measuring and managing um, this year's data so we can plan for next year. I could like to kind of dive into that topic. Um, we know that one of the common metrics for evaluating success in, in agriculture is yield, looking at bins and bushels and tons per acre and you know just that's that's the ultimate evaluation of whether you're a good farmer or not a good farmer or a successful farmer or not and from from where i sit and what i've been able to observe it appears to me like there's a lot of growers that are farming the inflation of the, the land value, that's what allows them to continue farming. But when they actually look at the profitability, it's kind of a guessing game as to where they are. And, and part of the challenges is, <laughs> you know, the profit and loss is a bit more complicated than just purchasing in, um, you know, materials and manufacturing and, and putting it back out. And it's all just clean lines. You have, um, you know, hailstorms, you have a 10 year average, you have, you know, there's, there's lots of things to look at when we consider um, success on an operation. So maybe we could start there and, and just, um, you could share with us what, what are you looking at when you evaluate uh, and, and what do you consider success in the, you know, in the short term, but then also maybe in the long term? How do you um, think about success of your operation? Um, Steve, maybe you could lead out on this one. Okay. Well, this, this might be a, a little unconventional because we're, um, you know, we, we sell, we sell a lot, we service a lot of markets in Northern Colorado area, a lot of restaurants in the Denver area, et cetera. And so we're in touch with a lot of different people who are aware of <clears throat> what good health maybe looks like 
and are striving for that. And so this, this, this metric, um, I, I guess I said earlier, you know, one of our goals is to connect people with real food. Well, that, that statement right there is, is confusing and possibly inflammatory. You know, people say, well, if you've got a plant growing in the ground and you pick something off it, that's real, right? Well, not necessarily, okay? And so when I, when I am talking about real food, I'm talking about food that has dynamic flavor because it's full of life and nutrition. That's, mm-hmm. that's my definition of real food. And there's, there's a lot more to that. But <clears throat> one of the main things, okay, well, I say this is unconventional, I think it, it, it hits a part of the answer, though, that needs to be heard and talked about because I've experienced this. And as I interact, you know, directly with our uh, markets and, and get to talk to people face to face about things. But taste, OK, taste is one of those metrics that I use and that we use to tell if we're doing a good job or not. I believe taste is telling us something. I believe it's an indicator of nutrients. If it tastes good, I believe it is good. And SAP testing, which I want to talk about later on in the the podcast, has really proven this to me that when you have healthy looking plants because you're feeding them well and you're taking care of the soil, you end up with this dynamic flavor. So consequently, um, I literally taste almost everything before we harvest to make sure if it's ready, are the carrots sweet, you know, is, are things ripe? Did they get enough water? This kind of thing. Because I really uh, am a firm believer that taste and nutrition go hand in hand. You know, we have a lot of people today that don't like to eat produce because it doesn't taste good. And interesting enough, I've found that if someone doesn't like tomatoes, for example, Uh, Chances are they've never had a real one, okay? (laughs) And if their experience with tomatoes is a grocery store tomato that was picked green in California and was gas ripened to give it some color, well, then I understand why they don't like tomatoes. Okay, that's that's a prime example of, of fake food versus real food. But when you give them the opportunity to taste a vine ripened, fresh picked heirloom tomato, Nine times out of 10, they have a change of mind. And I have a number of people who have begun eating real food because it tastes good. They've reconnected with real food because of the taste. So I love giving people that experience of real food. You know, not only do I gain a new customer through that experience, but through great taste, you know, I've potentially given them the gift of feeling better, having more energy because they're eating real food. And I I think to maybe wrap up my, my, my thoughts on this, um, I think at some point in time as, as growers, you know, as I'm speaking to growers and farmers, we need to ask ourselves this question. Why are we growing things? Are we growing mm-hmm. things just to make money or to increase a profit margin? Or, or, or are we growing things because they're actually good for people to eat? And I believe that question puts a tremendous responsibility on those of us who are farmers to grow food in the best possible way. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, that's that's very powerful. Um, so taste is wonderful, Steve. I, I totally understand that. It makes perfect sense. But now, um, how does that equate to profitability? What what are What are your experiences in how better taste, better flavor. Um, Because at the end of the day, if if you do all of that and yet your banker or your financial um, advisors say, "Uh, sorry, (laughs) better sell the farm, you know, you're you're bankrupt. That's that's you know, that's the metric. That's also a metric that needs to be added on that layer of, of flavor and taste. So I'm just I'm curious what your experience has been in that with how does taste and flavor and your focus and goal on that equate to um, the financial side of it? Well, obviously, if you're, if you have something that tastes good, people are going to buy it. They're going to, they're going to be attracted to that product and they're going to reconnect with food. You're going to gain more customers, but I'm glad you asked that because um, 
Let me let me just highlight one of the crops on our farm that we were struggling with, and that was our heirloom tomatoes. Our environment, as Joel knows, <laughs> out west here is very harsh. Um, you know, we deal with altitude, which equates to intense sun, blasting winds, uh, cold nights, hot days. Tomatoes hate all that. So we've moved all of our tomatoes inside to, in a high, high tunnel scenario, uh, still growing in soil. I believe in growing in living soil. But we were struggling with that program. And so <clears throat> three years ago, we connected with AEA. I believe it was through an acres conference of some sort. And <clears throat> I was very intrigued with their sap testing program that they offered, that you guys offered, mm -hmm. and was hoping that that could help us dial in some better results. So three years ago, we, we jumped into that program, began to take the leaf sam samples or the petiole samples and, and started sap testing. I have been very happy with those results and, and also the consultation that, that comes with it. There's been <clears throat> or there, such, such a, a huge improvement in the last three years in our tomato programs, in the plant and in and fruit and in production that last year I decided to actually keep track of what we were doing. So we weighed every tomato. We have a, a particular hoop house that we dedicate and rotate crops. We have several houses, but we dedicate one to tomatoes every year. And we weighed every tomato coming out of that house. From 2020 to 2021, we had a 23% increase in production. Hmm to give you some solid numbers. Now, I don't know what it was in 19. I think we were close to that in 19. So that's how, how, how much we were struggling um, with some of our soil issues, salinity and, and all kinds of stuff. You know, anybody who's grown tomatoes, um, very needy crop, very hungry crop, very um, feed me this right now, kind of a crop or, or, you know, you don't have a month to adjust, you know, you've got to adjust immediately. So it's, it's that kind of, kind of a crop. Yes. So I have to say that the one thing that I was not expecting by SAP testing was the education that, that that gave to me. Um, it's helped me to recognize certain nutritional needs and make feeding adjustments before plants become stressed or set back. Mm -hmm. And for us, the uh, when you're looking at a, you know, a potential, there's a lot of potential. Uh, tomatoes can be a high dollar crop if you have the market. There's a lot of potential there, and the, the cost of sap testing was minimal, but then the education was unexpected. Number one, and uh, powerful just absolutely powerful to where I was learning to recognize some of those um, needs within that particular crop. I also want to say that a, we use a variety of fertilizers and organic fertilizers on the farm and <clears throat> AEA fertilizers have been very effective for us. You know, initially we just use them on the, the tomatoes. Uh, we started, we do some trellis cucumbers as well. We, we, we use them on those. Those are kind of a similar crop with a lot of needs and, and very hungry and, and uh, you can, can be a, a tough manage if you're going for high production. Uh, it, this, this year we just, I don't have any comparison numbers, but I was very satisfied. We did start keeping track of some of our, our uh, high tunnel trellis cucumbers um, where I'll have some numbers next year to share with, with as far as comparison, but been very happy with the re results of that. But that uh, your fertilizers or AEA, as far as dialing things in, is leading the charge now on how we feed things at the farm. And quite honestly, in some way or another, whether that's through fertigation or foliar, we're using those fertilizers on every part of the farm at this point. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Joel, let's go with you on that same question of how do you... Um, think about success when you think success what is that and what's it mean to you and how are you measuring that yeah i think with these broad acre crops i mean ultimately i'm not i'm not direct selling um specifically but these are these are contracted crops there is uh, a certain level of quality and standard that the the uh processors are looking for and I, i'm going to include um 
wheat in this in this topic too. Uh, we raised some seed wheat for a, a, a local seed cleaner. And so like for example, wheat, they're really concerned about test weight, uh, which for them translated into a, a better quality seed that they can sell. For popcorn, they're looking for a for a a, a kernel that's going to pop well and have a good visual appearance and be, be, be have a large kernel. And for edible beans, um, they want uh, a consistent uh, bean that is easier to clean and that they don't have to tear out and has a good visual appeal and shelf life. So those are all factors that we can chase. And um, again, unfortunately at this point, it all gets put in the same bin and they process and sell it. Still working on that uh, for my end of it, but but it, it is satisfying to know that, well, your seed wheat had had two points heavier test weight this year. And so that's a better quality for me, for, for the seed producer. Um, the popcorn, it, it looks good. It pops well. It tastes good. It's a tender, it's a, it has a tender texture to it. And, and the edible beans, well, there's not a lot of clean out that we have to worry about. Um, so, so that's probably a, a general factors that we can, we can uh, actually influence. And, and chase after, and again, with the sap testing and the, and the, the nutrient balances that we can work on those things. Um, specifically in field, uh, popcorn is notorious for its lack of stock strength. Um, I unfortunately like to say that, I don't like to say that, you know popcorn is ready to harvest when it falls over. And so it, it's a real challenge, can be a challenge to harvest, but um, We've noticed when we manage the nitrogen on our, on our popcorn, in fact, greatly reduce it, and that, that popcorn is, is using uh, a biologically active soil, uh, uh, available calcium and carbon to drive the system instead of nitrogen, you end up with a much stronger and healthier plant. Um, you know, initially, David, I think we, we looked at some of those comparisons between a conventional nitrogen program and a, and a more conservative nitrogen program. And those, those first inner nodes down at the base of the stock were much more tightly compacted and stronger with limited nitrogen. And that field stood to harvest. And so for me, that harvestability is a huge factor. Um, and, then, and then of course with edible beans, just not having to apply some sort of pesticide every 10 days during pod fill is just better for everybody. And um, I mean, we certainly pay attention to them and manage the nutrition through harvest, but we're not out there with something dangerous um, all, the, all the time. And, and they, they respond very well to that, uh, to that managed nutrition. Great, Joel. And, I, and I'd like to follow that with, with a similar question that I had for Steve, you, your your crops are contracted, you have a certain price and, and you probably get a dock um, or, or get paid a slightly lower price if you don't meet those quality metrics. But then above and beyond, um, you know, you're, you're not really being rewarded for these efforts. So when you, when you think about the profit and the finance, where are you getting rewarded for, you know, for, for the things that you're doing? And you had better stock strength, great, and better harvestability. Do you have any? Um, are you are you measuring like what what factors that persuade you that there's economical sense in in moving this direction of regenerative agriculture? Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess let me let me let's back this up maybe another step maybe to a bigger picture even it, at least for my operation this goes beyond just a, using a different fertilizer for a specific crop really i have to look also at at multiple years at a crop rotation at the entire system so it, i think it's a real challenge on my sandy ground under a center pivot to raise a consistent corn crop every year. Okay, that is not a sustainable regenerative practice. But if I can develop that sustainable crop rotation that has a better, a better understanding and realization of our resource concerns in Southwest Nebraska, 
rather than trying to farm corn like they might in Illinois um, and raising crops that are more appropriate for our area and that are going to be more consistent through drought and hail and wind and tempest and fire. And that's, that's probably the profitability angle that I, I'm looking at over a long term. What is consistent and how can we use that rotation to set ourselves up for uh, popcorn or edible beans or these really high dollar, high value crops that can then benefit from that multi-year rotation. Mm -hmm. And so that we're not um, throwing everything every year at these high dollar crops and maybe burning the system out. Um, it's, it's a long-term thinking um, when, it, when it comes to that nature of it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, great. Well, let's let's uh, let's hear Zach's answer <laughs> to this question of success, evaluating success, and measuring um, measuring that. Uh, measuring for me, uh, both of you two, that was super well done. Uh, I'm a visual person, and I'm also a uh, uh, to some degree, uh, I guess a risk taker, uh, I kind of went for, let's see how fast I can find the bottom and then let's build this deal back up, uh, in a, in a roundabout way. Uh, I mean, it, it's been a slow process, but there I got to a point in time where, I mean, we haven't added, uh, uh phosphorus, uh, potash, you name it, anything, no fungicides, no, you know, I'm still hooked on the herbicides in a roundabout way. Uh, but anyhow, so I tried to essentially crash the system. I had to stay viable. Let's not kid ourselves. I do owe a bank money and I am responsible to pay them back. Uh, mm -hmm. But so I think I've found the bottom and now I'm working my way back up. Uh, I was, I'm one that's willing to like take that chance uh what can i do on zero and i've done that on multiple pieces and not one or two or three acres but on 30 or 60 or 80 acres uh what does zero do for me multiple years in a row it's pretty amazing what you can actually do with zero which kind of gives me hope uh you know i kind of told you it was the no tail on the plains deal and looking at the going back to the days of the prairie and, you know, how all this, look at my road ditches, they never get harvested, they grow, they're green. Uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of how I uh, view life in a roundabout way and life on my farm. Uh, you know, a couple of instances, I can tell you we do, I do uh, seed rye and have been for multiple years. It started off as for me, it was something to, uh, it was a cover crop. Uh, then we got cattle, we could graze it all. So, uh, now it's actually part of my rotation. I come in with a big uh, mix of seeds. We graze it. Uh, in fact, I just pulled my cows off the last couple of days and brought them to corn stalks. But part of, part of where I'm going with this is we sell this seed, have it tested. Uh, you know, my, my germ is very, very good on my rye with no inputs. And I've been doing this for eight, nine, 10 years, and it is like upper 90s, uh, 97, 98, 99% with no chemicals, no fertilizer. I plant it and I harvest it, period. Uh, I do clean my own seed. Uh, but the second aspect there is when I graze that cover crop or my stocks, uh, I'm a naturalist. Uh, my cattle fend for themselves. They do not get fed unless we have some terrible winter event where they need supplemented, but it has to be really bad. And they do super good. In a, in a year with 30 or 40 head, I may spend $100, $200, $300 in, in vet expense that's it. I mean, I almost never have problems. The only, the only creatures I've lost in my system are ones that I brought in from an outside, you know, by three, four, five here or there, and they're from a little bit of a different uh, uh, place. But, you know, in seven or eight years, we've lost very, very few. Uh, the livestock is very, very healthy. Uh, my brother and I are running almost 80 or 90 head. We have 80 acres of pasture is it and that sounds like that number doesn't match up but we use rye 
into May, sometimes into June, form to graze. It compresses our window of pasture life. When I take off the cereal grain in the first or second week in July, in 45 days, we have a really nice, uh, a really nice crop of stuff for them to graze. And we can get away, we can graze it all the way through January most of the time. So uh, and you're looking at a quarter or maybe two. So it's not, it's not that we're not talking huge expanse acres, uh, but the, the livestock part of the deal is partially how I measure some of this. Uh, mm -hmm. They do very well. Uh, you know, for me, a corn yield is down from where it was seven, eight, 10 years ago. Uh, I'm all right with that. Uh, I, I really honestly am, uh, want to sign the backs of more check or the, the backs of more checks and and I'm measuring some of my success in that honestly uh, uh, I'm all right without long term having to continue to uh, to pay for everything that's out there and a lot of my crops I'm raising right now are specialty crops uh, seed is provided for me trucking is provided I found a couple of nice niche niche markets uh, so and as you go along more of this stuff uh, you know, that stuff either falls into your lap or somebody hears about, oh, here's, here's what you're doing. Uh, there, there are some, there are some really neat things out there that you can do. And, you know, for me, a lot of this also comes back to, I have kids that are in high school at some point in time, I would like to bring them back to the farm and, you know, what is the next enterprise for me? I want to do something like Steve's doing. I think that's beautiful and it's awesome. Uh, can we produce real food, farm to table, pick your own, clean it up with pasture raised pork, which John has been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this stuff is, and, and I think it would be a great avenue for me to bring my kids back because under our conventional system, it wasn't happening. We, we had too many miles feeding off of a couple of thousand acres. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is a way for me to uh, do something on a smaller scale that's more viable and I think is better just for people in general. Mm -hmm. great excellent excellent any of you guys have questions for each other in in any of those responses all right great so so there's there's you know different scenarios different um crops you're growing different reasons why you got started, you know, from health to um, opportunity to just, you know, something new. So um, I'd be interested to hear, this is not maybe so much on the, it is actually on the measuring because you can, you can go to a bank and you can, you know, put together a good plan and, and float a good story for a couple years, say three years or five years and, and, and kind of get by with it. But what are you seeing? Um, like what's one or two things that you see that you're persuaded that this is, this is the long-term future. This is what um, I can see my children, you know, doing this or grandchildren, or this is, this is the right way to go and, and success from more of a macro perspective than from an immediate financial perspective. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, what, what are a point or two or three that, that come to your mind that, that you've either seen or that you're, um, that convinced you in such a way that you, you've uh, not turned around and turned back to chemical agriculture and, and spraying insects? Um, Steve, you want to, want to lead on that one? Well, that might be a hard question for me to answer. I mean, we, we were committed from the beginning to growing organically. Um, we were certified at, 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 um, for a while and then got, got tired of, uh, too much government oversight that didn't fit my personality. <laughs> so, but still committed to, that kind of growing, I think the term regenerative agriculture is is uh, is is the better term. But we never did use chemicals on the farm. You know, the beautiful thing about this place is that it it had been set idle for about twenty years, so it was immediately certifiable. We had a lot of weeds to clean up and a lot of those kind of things, and that's been very challenging to to work with some of those issues. But we 
had never experienced personally that transition from conventional ag um, to what we're doing now. You know, we always had that commitment and we've just built on that uh, from the beginning. Wonderful. What about you, Joe? <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, well, let's talk about fertilizer prices. Um, or rather, if you don't want to, we don't have to, but it's, uh, <laughs> It is sort of an interesting position to be in where, sure, I'm going to have to buy some fertilizer next year, but because the system, the regenerative system is beginning to develop and with the crop rotations and the different way of managing fertility, I know I'm going to have to buy fertilizer, but it's not like all my hope is found in fertilizer that I have to buy from a conventional fertilizer place. Um, I'm beginning to understand how how these crops actually grow um, with a biological system. And so it just isn't a concern. And um, I think in our area, there's we in southwest Nebraska, we've been able to raise a lot of corn under irrigation and, and have been had been very successful at it. But there is a growing sense that it's not going to last forever and that it's whether it could be the weather, it could be the politics of our water uh, supply. It's going to be the politics of the corn and soybean markets in the general global market that um, starting to move in a direction that actually acknowledges the limits of our environment and the limits of our resources mm -hmm. is a very freeing and comforting thing. It's very grounding to just be able to understand that, okay, my sand does not raise 250 bushel corn every year. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not responsible of me to spend the money to import the resources to do that. So mm -hmm. I need to go down a different direction. Mm -hmm. And right. that's, that takes a change in mindset that I have to be open to growing something else, to doing something else. Mm -hmm. Um, I, to be honest, I've always been a crop guy. I like sitting in my tractor. Um, and my father has been the, the cattle person. But we're in an environment where livestock and cattle have a significant role to play. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out even how the conventional approach to raising livestock in southwest Nebraska might be flawed. How do we change that so that we're taking advantage of the resources that we have here? Mm -hmm. And again, it's not, we're not overrunning our headlights or overshooting our skis or whatever, whatever phrase you want to use. It's being realistic about where we are and knowing that making these changes now, I, I don't have kids in high school. I've got kids six and under that knowing that it is worth making those changes um, to our own system now. And so that, so that there's something here because it is a good place to raise a family. And so ultimately that's, that's why we're doing this, right? It's for our family, for our kids and for the next generation. So I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> that's a perfect answer, man. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah that's right. very good. I, um, I want to hear Zach's answer and then I want to come back to a, to, um, a comment you made there. So Zach. Mm -hmm. but David, I hate to tell you this. I'm going to have to ask you to re-ask that question after listening to both of those two. I'm trying to, I'm like, uh, okay, what did, what was the question here? <laughs> uh, well, let me think. Um, so the is, as you look at, at the longer term, the bigger picture, what's, what's, you know, something that, that you have seen happen? Like, is there a change in your farm? Is there a change in is something that you've seen or, or what is it that, has persuaded you to continue. And, and like you said, Zach, you, you know, you're more kind of a, a crash everything and start from the base and figure out what works. So what, maybe the question for you specifically yeah, is what, what is it that to say, this has got to change? I'll tell you the biggest change is my attitude showing up every day, wanting to be a part of it and do something different is unbelievable. And we were never cattle people on our farm. In fact, we did let people pasture our stocks, but it always drove us crazy. Fence was left around. Oh, cow guy, you know, stomp down, whatever. It's been the most enjoyable thing, uh, integrating cattle into our deal. And this is coming from somebody who knew nothing about them. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely uh, love that. But 
one of the things that has changed the most is my attitude. I don't like the tractor time that Joel talked about. I, I like being outside. I like digging holes. I like the earthworms. I like everything, uh, root systems and the, the, the chaos mixes that we plant to graze are my favorite. How do plants interact with each other? Why is it so good right here? Why is it not as good right here? That is, uh, that's kind of what brings me joy and that's what's worth it. Now, that being said, I, I, we do have to make money and, I, and I'm getting by, I'm not making my money hand over fist. Uh, but I do think that, that there is an avenue down the road to do that. For example, my rye crop, I'm gonna be uh, very honest with you. If cash rent for me is 250 or $270 an acre, we're in a, we're in a all corn soybean world, mostly corn, irrigation, right? You could water as much as you possibly want. Uh, and this is pumped out of the ground at only about 13 or 18 feet. So it's accessible also. In my area, it is very odd to see a cereal grain or any other crop type for that matter. Uh, but the rye crop, I might make 100 maybe $200 an acre on my rye crop with nothing. But it's a crop that I'm not losing on. I don't have to rely on insurance. Uh, I, I don't have any inputs. And yes, I may not be getting wealthy off the deal, but by the time I grow, I grow a lot of my own seeds to plant back also. So that kind of makes a, another unique, you know, the seed business is kind of a unique and interesting uh, thing. And, I, and I'm not growing 20 or 30,000 bushels of rye. I'm, I'm seven, eight, 10, 12,000 bushels, mostly sourced to neighbors, friends, all within, uh, you know, uh, 50 miles. I have a co-op. I'm above wholesale, below retail. They buy it from me. They turn around and sell it to their 5,000 members. It works good for both of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the things that I really like. I like the relationships, the beef, uh, selling a quarter for uh, or a, a full beef when it's finished 27 months later for $2,000 cutting everybody else out except for the butcher to me is worth every penny of it. I get to put a little extra in my pocket. My local butcher still gets paid and these people get a very good product that is responsibly raised and tastes good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, maybe we got this thing all backwards. You know, I, I just hear all of your answers and you're all saying, yeah, we need to make money, but money's taken the back seat. Yeah. It's, it's, you're, you're connecting to, may I say, life and what's really important in life. I mean, Joel says it, it's a change in mindset. It's when my mind shifted and I started thinking about this as a system and I, you know, I stopped just measuring yields and thinking about 250 bushel corn. Then suddenly I was open to a lot more opportunities and ideas and thinking about a longer term future and what is sustainable. And, and another comment you made, Joel, there is, is that, you know, you don't think it's a, a good steward to be bringing in all the resources that it takes to grow 250 bushels per acre of corn. And, and does that not really what it all boils down to? Um, Zach says, when I had a change in my attitude, you know, it's so it's, it's all about, you know, why are we doing what we're doing, which maybe um, mentioned that early on, like, why are we doing what we're doing? And maybe our, our measurement for success and our metrics for making decisions for next year, uh, maybe we need some um, some attitude meters or some mindset um, barometers. <laughs> So I, I, that's those are great answers and and really exciting to me. I think you know in in life we need to be making money, but I think the money follows after when we do the things that are right. Um, you know, it, it becomes less of the focus, and we get that why correct. And suddenly, you know, we're we're looking at how do we make do with the resources we have right here in Nebraska, as Joel said, and. Really, it makes us more sustainable in the long term. And suddenly, you know, some of these water politics and, and whatever all may come down the pike are much less um, threatening. They're, 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 
it really doesn't rock our boat very much because we've not been dependent on that. We're, we're sustainable. And, and I think even weather plays into that. We, you know, we have organic matter of three, four percent. We can take a lot more water and a lot more drought um, because of that. But with that, um, we do need to move on here. And I'm curious, you know, when you when when we put away that mindset kind of stuff, which maybe for some of you out there is is like, whew, you know, that's pie in the sky. Maybe you're all dropping off like flies right now. I don't know. Hopefully not, because that's where it really goes. It's about our heart and, and, and what life is really about. But do you all have any tools that you use that are that you find very valuable in in measuring and managing data over time that allows you to see trends or allows you to see profitability improvements and help you make decisions like, hey, when we put on, say, the fall primer, rejuvenate sea shield spectrum, we inoculate biology. At this time, we actually get this response or it's, it's, you know, it's better to put it on there. Do you have tools or systems that, that you found to be very helpful that would be um, helpful for, for our audience today. Zach, maybe, maybe we'll start with you on that one. Well, so I guess, you know, as far as the AEA stuff, I'm two years in first year, didn't do as good a job as I should have on the SAP on a routine, you know, all of the stuff, summer starts to happen. Things get crazy, chaotic. This year was a lot better. I, I don't have any solid answers on any of that, but I do, I do believe in every bit of it. And, uh, and if I, and if you don't, and if you don't believe in it, it's, it's hard to take that leap, right. And something that you can't physically measure, but I do think you can see some of this stuff. You can see the reactions, uh, and, and lots of, you know, you're going to, you're talking about the fall primer, for example, which, uh, that's not a visual one right now. Right. And, uh, and this is the first year actually that I left multiple strips out there. The, the, the last year I didn't do that. So I'm dying to see next spring or next May. Is there a difference right here? Uh, the SAP analysis is when Steve talked about education earlier, uh, it's an unbelievable education. And, and I'm not a rocket scientist. In fact, my mind's hardly set up for all of those uh, numbers and the chaos. And I, I just hope over time that I continue to, to build that database, uh, grow and uh, keep figuring it out and be able to be one step ahead all the time. Uh, you know, maybe we can get to a, a point in time where our system is actually uh, rocking and alive uh, biologically uh, that we're going to have to use very small trace amounts of whatever it might be, manganese, calcium, you name it. Uh, so, I mean, that's, kind of, I guess, uh, I don't have a solid answer for you there, but uh, as far as the measurement, the measuring goes, uh, but I, but I wholeheartedly believe in it and uh, I, th I think it's the right thing to do. Great. Excellent. What about you, Steve? You already well, told it, tomatoes. What else? Well, you know, I mentioned the sap analysis earlier. We've, we've only done that with tomatoes and our cucumber crop. I think there's probably advantage to, to using that on other areas of the farm. You know, your soil test is basically a shotgun approach to really what's going on there. It gives you maybe a general idea of what's going on. But uh, so, yeah, we, we spoke to the SAP analysis. That's been our main measurement of, of determining whether things were different. Uh, if, if we were actually observing correctly you know what i thought maybe was a nitrogen deficiency was really an iron deficiency in the tomato plants and and really understanding some of these issues clearly and then be beginning to observe and pinpoint things even before the sap came bass back and and we were mostly correct on that i think um you know, I can, I can echo what, what Zach's saying too, you know, we're, we're kind of new into this as far as understanding the power of soil life and, and, and feeding those microbes and all of these things. There's a lot that we have, have just started to do and, and, are, and, have, and have been doing the last three years that we're seeing better quality in our soil and better, better response in our crops without input as we rotate um, through the houses, et cetera, on different crops. But it's, uh, 
I think, you know, when you, when you start from that commitment that this is the way to farm, okay, that we want to be part of the answer, not part of the problem. If we recognize that our food system is broken and we want to be part of the answer to fix that, then if you start with that kind of commitment, then you just keep adding. You're always looking for how can we do this better and how can I understand this better? And with all the pressures in life and the limited time you have to, to seek out information, and read books, et cetera, and plug into information, you get what you can and, and you implement it, that into your life. And just a little bit that we've done outside of SAP analysis, the, the SAP analysis um, hands down is phenomenal just absolutely has been phenomenal for our tomato crop to capture. Let me say this as well, to capture the attention of a high market, to capture the attention of some of the best, best restaurants in downtown Denver, they're not going to take a, a mediocre crop. They're looking to wow their customer. Right. And so you've got to meet them where they're at. And if you've got that kind of product, we never had that product before we were able to dial in with sap analysis and really started to feed the soil, take care of biology to where those things just started coming into balance. Yeah. So we've been able to capture some high-end markets, some high-end restaurants, simply because we're able to produce a crop that, that tastes good because it is good. It's, it's top shelf. And then you're able to charge for it because people are going to say, we need more Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Uh, wow. So exciting. So exciting. Yeah. Joel, um, what, uh, do you have any specific tools or softwares or, or any, any methods or systems that you found very helpful? Well, yeah. I mean, I could sing the praises of SAP testing as well. I, it's, I, I, I've tried to take a SAP test every two weeks. Um, and, but I think, I mean, there's not only the data, the physical data that you get back, um, but there's the other side of just being out with your crop and spending time out there. You know, I really think that it's, it is at least a $100 an hour job and it might not be anything more than a pair of scissors and a Ziploc bag, but you're walking through your field and you're observing and you're seeing what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets to the point where you really do begin to sense or feel what's going on out in the field. So, and, true. and it's not as if I'm lying awake, correlating data points and observations um, and f forever. It's not at all. It's just having done this for four or five years, you get, begin to see a sense of how this is going to happen. And, mm -hmm. and you can begin to predict what a corn crop might do at tassel time. Yeah. And you begin to understand patterns and, and so you're able to be a little more proactive about what's going on. Um, I also think that the power of the observation or anecdotal data that we collect on our own oper operations needs to be more highly valued. Mm -hmm. um, where the industry wants to have a single factor or a single product or a single practice in all of their research. And you know, the scientific method as it stands today doesn't really like to deal with systems and multiple, vari multiple factors and, and various you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So yeah. our own observation I have found to be very valuable. And so I, I guess I don't put a lot of stock in the farm magazines that say you get a 7.3 yield bushel yield increase. If you just do this, well, how does that fit in your system? You yeah. Know, and so the value of, of, of observing, you know, taking pictures, taking notes and, and being able to look at all this from a, from a from a bird's eye view and say well what what's going on what could be going on we can't say for certain but here's what's working here's what's going in the right direction let's keep going down this road um has been very very beneficial um for me i have one one last question that i guess could be extensive or pretty simple that i'm going to put to you and then we'll just have some questions from the audience um and see if we can wrap it up here in 15 minutes or so. And if not, I guess we were, we were wanting to have just some fun and it's been a real pleasure. Um, so 
I'd like to to ask you if you think back over the journey, and it's been it's been so unique to have all three of you, and from from where you started and how you've come to where you are. Um, but is there is there anything that you've learned that you wish someone would have told you sooner, or that would have really you know helped you leap ahead in in this journey um, that you would now like to communicate to um, our audience? Um, Steve? Well, I don't think I have a, a silver bullet answer uh, for that. And, 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 and I guess quite simply, um, I think there's a lot of resources that have, that have helped us along the way. Probably the thing that I didn't fully understand was how important feeding soil life, biology, how important um, adding compost, um, kind of creating that environment to where your soil life brings things into balance. I didn't get that. I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I, uh, I'm beginning to understand that enough to where we're seeing results, but the extreme, how extremely important that is, was something I didn't get early on. So that as well as a lot of resources, AEA's resources, uh, podcasts, information, uh, SAP testing that stands out at the at at the top of the list, and there's a lot of other resources that have helped us. Probably more more geared to small farmers um, that have been very instrumental in helping us along the way. Acres USA, um, anything by Elliot Coleman, uh, Ben Hartman's the Lean Farmer. Again, all of these, most of these speak to smaller operations, very intensive operations like ours. And then Connor Crickmore out of New York with his Never Sink Farm information. Those have all had contributing pieces of, of tremendous value for what we've done. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. What about you, Zach? Uh, for me, I, it would be 10 years ago. I wish biology, 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 biology. Literally, you know, this started for me as no-till, less, uh, uh, less, tractor time, you know, more coverage, yada, 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 all this good stuff, right? And it's all really about feeding the soil. Biology, biology, biology. What does your soil need? I mean, I can't wait. Someday I'm going to take this list of four or five crops that I raise, and it will be 20 or 30. And I'm excited for that and uh, figuring out the order and what goes good together. The intercropping is a really uh, unique uh, fun thing. I've made some mistakes and uh, also in the process of doing some cool things with it. So, but the biology part of the deal for me is, uh, is what I wish I would have focused on and been alerted to more uh, 10 years ago. That's really good. And that's really powerful, Zach. And I, I would just add to that. I, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, how do I want to frame this? It's there's a lot of misconception or or just people don't realize how how much damage has been to the done to the biological system and to the to the plant soil symbiosis. That whole system's been so messed up, um, and and a lot of a lot of growers just don't realize, like you say. So that's that's a really good point. I'm glad you I'm glad you bring that up because it's uh, there's. There's really, if you start with sap analysis and with balancing plant nutrition and growing healthy plants, but you don't have the biology, it's really just a pretty quick dead end street. And you just have to be feeding more and more and more because you don't have that return loop where the increased and enhanced biology then is able to feed the plants. So I, I couldn't agree more that biology is, is really the key and the place to start. And anytime you do anything, that's damaging to the biology, whether that's an extreme weather event or a tillage pass you have to make or chemistry you have to use or whatever it may be in that transition, it is critical to just really be focused on re-inoculating the biology or feeding the biology some more, whatever it takes to, to allow that biology to snap back. What about you, Joel? What's yeah, related, um, related. something that you... So, yeah, related related to all of that, um, it's 
it's it's it's the biology and it's it's getting away from the mindset that if I just replace some conventional input with a biological input that the magic will happen and I will make a pile of money. Um, you know, I, I see the sense and a lot of people that want to go down this way, like they again, it goes back to this idea of profit somehow that that we can just simply simply replace input A for the input input B and it will all happen. And and I had a few hard lessons early on about that. That doesn't necessarily always come true. And so it is about the system and being honest about your resources and what you have and what you can do in your environment. And um, and I'm always amazed at these conversations, how they always become so much more than just talking about growing a plant and eating it in the ground. You know, we this idea of regeneration begins to, I mean, it might start with growing your crop, but then this way of thinking begins to bleed over into your family and your community and the way you think about things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're trying to raise real food. Well, maybe in a sense, we're just trying to be real people again. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. It's so good. So, so when, when we kind of just summarize all of this, it really boils down to the reason and the purpose for growing food for even having a tractor for even living on a farm needs to be, you know, about life. And, and the more we care for life, not only the crops that we're growing, but the people who are eating it and how it affects the community, the more fulfilling our occupation is going to be. And, and I think that's really where, where it, it, it all hinges as we measure so maybe, maybe the bottom line for this, and I have no intentions of going here, this is, this is um, really unique, but really the ultimate measurement is how you feel at the end of the day or at the end of the year as to how satisfied, fulfilled, um, just how are you as an individual being improved or, or enjoying your life, right? That, isn't that the ultimate measure of success is, you know, if, if I'm, I'm making enough money, but really it doesn't matter if we have millions and billions of dollars. And we, I think we've all seen some of those people who have millions and billions and really don't seem to be enjoying life all that much. So maybe that's the ultimate measure we need to be looking at each year at the end of each season is to not so much quantify how many bushels and bins we got, but are we profitable? Are we moving in the right direction? But then also, is there anything about our operation that would take away from that fulfillment or would take away from um, that connection to life? Powerful. Well, I've got some more questions for you here from the audience. And John, um, you feel free to jump in here at any time. I'm sure you have all kinds of thoughts as well. But a, a great question here from John Warmerdam. Thank you for coming on, John. Those of us in the stone fruit industry feel the same about getting paid the same for a better quality product. Do any of you see a path to reap a financial benefit from producing better food or should we leave that to another generation and just enjoy the quiet joy of growing better food? Steve, I think your experience probably um, would be uh, a great fit to start with the response to that question. What would you well, encourage? Yeah, I, I, I would definitely, I, I don't think we have to wait for another generation. You know, five years ago, um, in Greeley, Colorado's kind of, if, if anybody knows about Weld County, Colorado, used to be the richest county in the nation, mostly because of agriculture. And it still carries a lot of that. And so here we sit, you know, right in the middle of Agville, where five years ago, people were really not concerned about the quality of the food. They were more concerned about the price of a dozen ears of corn. We've seen that change. And yes, we are, we branch out to, um, the markets where people really do understand how important food is. You know, we're in several Denver markets and, and Boulder, Colorado, and, and all of these places. But we've seen a change, not just there, but here, to where people didn't really care about how the food was grown. Now they care about how it's grown. People are paying attention. I like to tell this story real quick, really, that when I was in grade school 50 years ago, 
We never heard of childhood cancer, never heard of childhood diabetes. There was one obese kid in my class. This was 50 years ago in grade school. And I asked people, okay, what's changed in 50 years? What's changed in 50 years is how we grow food. And I, I think if we're a part of that, that, that solution to taking care of the soil and growing food that people actually want to, want to eat that not only tastes good, but is good for them, that they're actually feeling better because they're eating great food. And I think that opportunity to answer that question is here right now. Mm -hmm. So um, just to follow up to that question, Steve, is do you have any practical from your experience, do you have any practical like how to or steps of, you know, let's say you're a stone fruit producer, you know, let's, you know, you have, you have larger, what, what are some practical like uh, steps for someone to start exploring those opportunities? Well, I think that's a good question. I don't know if I fully have the answer for that because we've always been focused on on quality and taste and taste is, you know, if, if you're letting the money lead you, okay, you're going to be, you're going to be going down a certain path. If you're letting health lead you, if you're letting the quality of the product lead you. If your conscience is leading you, okay, this is something that I can pick up and eat right in front of my customers because it's pure. It hasn't been sprayed with anything. But to answer that question, I think that if you're producing a, a superior product, and growing is only half the picture. When you're trying to capture a market of people who care about quality, when you harvest, fresh picked, does that product taste good? You've got to fine tune all of those numbers. I know we, we deal with peach growers um, and I've finally connected with a couple that do just an absolutely fantastic job of growing but that's only half the equation. The other half is when are they picking their fruit? When are they watering their crop? And how, how is that crop when it actually gets to the customer? You've got to put yourself in that customer's shoes like we've done to, okay, what kind of experience do you want them to have? And, and is this a one-time hit? Okay, if, if I have a tomato, you buy my tomato and you pay me a dollar or whatever the price is. And that's, if I feel like I won and this is a one-time deal, that's the wrong way to thinking. We, our thinking here is that we want to have a, a long-term relationship with these people because not only do we care about our health, but we care about their health. And that introduction to something that's real, that tastes good because it is good, is that carrot, I guess, on the, on the stick to introduce them, sometimes reintroduce them, or for the first time, introduce them to real food that's going to set them on a path to, to better health. Awesome. Great. Um, Joel or Zach, do you have any additional thoughts on that? I think I'm going to let Steve take care of that one. Well, I was, I, I guess I was going to ask Steve, um, do you think, I guess I'm assuming that you have a much bigger population and market market base than I do in Southwest Nebraska, obviously. Yeah. A little bit. Um, I guess I've been, I've been somewhat, the observation I've noticed in, in our area, in a small town, small county, is that the price of food can be a real barrier to people. Um, you know, for example, I had, had a friend that had some farm-raised chickens, but, oh, they were, they were a little bit more expensive in the grocery store, you know. And, uh, you know, so I'm wondering if, if, if there is any difference in the challenge of trying to uh, develop that relationship, to develop that concept of that the food that I produce is much better for you and it tastes better, even in a small populated area um, where, yeah, I'm going to charge more for it because the value is there. Um, I'm throwing a lot of thoughts out there, but I, I just wonder if we could replicate that same system in a smaller population with a smaller popula population area. I think sure, that's a good. I think that's a good question, and we have bumped up against that challenge, especially in, in our area, that people don't yet um, fully value mm -hmm. a fresh picked, picked real product. Okay, and and you hate to say, okay, well, 
uh, somebody has to have a, a health challenge or a health failure before they want to connect with the best mm-hmm. of the best to try to, quote, fix themselves. Sometimes that's the case, but different things can promote people to want to pursue a very high value, valuable crop. And I can't make them do that. I know that's very challenging on a, in a smaller community where uh, I don't have an answer for that. But we're seeing changes here in Greeley and in our area, and not just in these outside areas where you got people that really do want a high quality product and are willing to pay for it. And I, I've wondered too, if, if it's important to remember that, remember that we might buy watermelons from Mexico, which they're fine. But if I buy watermelon from you, you know, I know you and I, I'm helping buy shoes for your kids to go to school, you know, right. and I'm, you know, there's, I can really see where my dollars are going. And I think that even in a small rural town where we have nothing but agriculture, we sometimes forget that if we're all we're doing is raising corn and soybeans, those dollars are still going somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's my thought on that. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, listening, listening to the conversation here, my thoughts go to, um, are we selling the product or are we selling the experience and and you know one of the things that whether by intent or or by default um it has so happened that growers a lot of growers and food producers believe that they don't have what it takes to sell their food and 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 the food that they're growing in a similar way that they don't believe they have the ability to grow their own seeds because it's just too complicated and a lot of that um, comes from the indoctrination of that thought just again and again and again for generation after generation. It's like, you believe it. Oh, growing seeds is too complicated. But when we actually stop and we look at what does it take to produce a seed and a high quality seed and do selective, um, you know, select seeds and, and have the, the quality of that seed and, and the value of our um, soils coming back and building on itself. I think we're, you know, we're missing a lot of, but back to the, back to the selling thing, a lot of farmers and, and whether you're growing fruits or vegetables, most buying everything retail, they're selling everything wholesale and somebody else makes the price. And I've, I've wondered if that's not a part of, you know, that shift of mindset, that change of attitude when a farmer says, Hey, it costs me, you know, five dollars to grow this, and I'm not going to sell it for a profit margin of less than this. And and I'm selling you the experience of something different than everybody else. And therefore, my prize is ten dollars, not five dollars that you're offering me. And now the food industry definitely does you know present a little bit of an extra challenge there because when your tomatoes are ripe, they're ripe for you know, not six weeks until the market shifts, they're, they're right now. And so there is that challenge that comes into that, into that marketing aspect. And Hey, we take what we want, but I, I think the shift in mindset is again, probably John, I would say to your question, um, that just that shift in mindset where, where you say my product is worth this and I'm going to pursue markets that are able to pay me what my product is worth including the experience of, of experiencing my product. All right, we have a couple more questions. We need to keep moving here. Um, if using no-till methods and minimal disturbance, is it necessary to apply soil primer every year? Maybe that's more of a consultant question, but I think you all, um, from a farmer perspective, it'd be great to hear your thoughts. I believe in it personally, just surely out of I'm growing four crops right or five crops whatever it is we need to feed that soil with lots of different things and in a in a true uh, uh, that's a very small sample of uh, I, I think we need to I mean the bio coat gold for me goes on every seed it was important enough I bought a seed treater just for the biological uh, part of bio coat gold and you know my own backwoods uh 
compost pile out here that I brew a little tea and I can't even tell you how good or how bad it is. It's something that I find important and, and I want to add every time uh, I'm planning something. So to me, it's worth it. I think it's valuable and uh, I'm not going to change doing it. Yeah, I've, I've seen it really make a difference. Um, you know, we still do some strip tillage uh, for our uh, irrigated ground and I've noticed that the strip tiller pulls a lot easier where that's been applied for the last four or five years. That soil just behaves differently. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes, it comes alive in the spring uh, sooner and earlier. Um, and, but I, I will say in our environment, I have found the best benefit is to apply it when you have a living root. Mm -hmm. um, so applying it on dead corn stalks in the fall when it's cold and dry for three months, I'm not sure that the benefit is there. Um, if I apply uh, at least part of it um, early in the spring after I planted a cover crop and having that living root, then the biology can really take hold and go. And um, the cover crop will look great and that the previous crop residue uh, breaks down very quickly. Um, so you know that it's, it's active. Uh, at least that's what works for me in my environment. I think that's a really good point, which is actually um, interesting when rejuvenate and, and that whole soil primer system was first developed, it was actually in response to no-till growers who were struggling to deal with, with corn trash or, you know, they had three seasons worth of, of crop residue and it just wasn't going anywhere. So when we first developed that system and, and put, promoted that system, um, that, that's one of the primary reasons was to help growers deal with cycling that residue and all the nutrients in that crop residue for the future crop. Now we have learned that there is some added benefit to, to having that biology break down that carbon in the winter. But I do agree with you, Joel, that if you can apply it um, to a living root, and especially we've seen with, with small grains where you can have the biology right on the seed or right in the seed slice, and now you've got all those seeds in close proximity. And just basically, as soon as you have roots growing, you have 100% of that acre covered in a very um, active biological hotbed. I mean, it just, whew, you just spread it across the whole, the whole acre in, in one shot. Okay, um, another question here. When transitioning to regenerative egg, a combination of soil biology and plant foliar approaches are generally used simultaneously. How do you determine which applications are generating the best results? So this may apply more to Steve doing the fertigation and foliar. I guess, Joel, you do some fertigation and foliar as well. Um, any thoughts on how, how you determine which applications are are generating the best results well i can i can speak to that some um with our tomato program for example i'm religiously fertigating and foliar every week and that is you know gives us the ability to put on different different nutrients uh from a different perspective you know k and, and for example is easily put on any way, any, whether it's fertigation or foliar. And a lot of times we just put that on foliar, but we, we use both, both uh, in combination because we've got a lot of inputs that I am putting on making minute adjustments um, every week for that crop. You know, it's, it's that intensive and that intentional. Great. Thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. And then there's actually a follow-up or an additional question within that question. Um, do you include any soil biology testing in conjunction with the SAP analysis, or is this even a relevant question if the whole system improves? Now I work with Joel, so I know we've not done, um, I don't think we've done any, any biological samples there. I'm kind of, I've done some Haney stuff the last couple of years and uh, I will, can, I've, I've kind of picked four or five particular places that I'm going to track over the next 10 years, but I am two or three into it. I have not seen anything that's uh, unusually crazy. I would say I have seen uh, steady improvement. 
but I think timing also matters. You know what I mean? Are you going to do it April 15th? Or are you going to do it October 3rd? Uh, uh, I kind of like to take some random samples at different times just to see what's actually happening out there. And it seems to, there is wide variations of what's happening uh, depending on timing. So that would be the one thing I would say is make sure your timing is, is uh, uh, timing is important, I think, when you're going to try and compare the two. Mm -hmm. and, and I think let's, let's not forget even just some of the basic principles of soil health, like a living root, keeping it covered. I think ultimately those still have the biggest biological benefit to soil health. And then when you start stacking your biological products, your inoculants, uh, micronutrients on top of those principles is when you start to see that magnifying effect. Um, I, I will still say that a, that a good cover crop with good residue um, and, and minimal disturbance does more for my soil than any amount of rejuvenate we can put out there or afford. Yep. Um, so yep. remember the basic principles. Now, when it comes to uh, those uh, foliar applications or fertigation through, like I put it on through the center pivot or with the planter in furrow, again, uh, measuring those applications uh, a week or 10 days later with a sap test to see what results we got, um, it has been very beneficial. And it shows that that system can can be dynamic and can be influenced that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a you, you bring up a really good point, Joel, with um, a living root. Keeping that soil covered is way more beneficial than tanker loads of rejuvenate. Mm -hmm. And and I would just add to that that rejuvenate was was never intended to feed the biology for the whole season. Rejuvenate is simply a delivery system. Um, to give the biology not just the food source but the tools and the enzymes and enzyme cofactors what they need to get established on that living root or on that cover uh, crop residue or wherever whatever environment you're putting them in and the rejuvenate is just a if you will kind of a, an emergency kit to get them going or to keep them from you know from dying off as quickly and so there's a higher rate of establishment and a better, you know, a better response from that. So, so true. The, the, the principles are very important. Um, question here, what kind of heirlooms does Steve grow? I always was wondering with Regen A, live soils, maybe sap analysis, is it feasible to grow heirlooms with their low production, cracking short shelf life, for example, on five to 10 acres, not under hoops in hot air at somehow somewhat challenging climate? Well, for, for us, um, in my area, no, I quit doing that. That's, that's not profitable for us. Colorado, it can hail tomorrow. Um, Wyoming can come kiss us with a 50 mile an hour wind and just shred plants. And so when, you know, we've got, we've got four months of our life into that crop before I ever see a, a ripe tomato. And so we started growing them inside. So for me personally, uh, it's too much time and, and other things invested into that crop that we, we never we never really see profitability outside. So I can't really answer that for us. That does not work. To answer what kind of heirloom tomatoes we have we have gone back to, um, we're, we're growing a lot of old fashioned varieties. And I I used to think that a yellow brandy wine, for example, okay, you're just not going to see the production there. There's truth to that. Last year, I saw yellow brandy wines matching some Marnero varieties, okay, where we've got heirloom cross varieties that we really believe in and that do are bred for a lot of high production. So, yes, we do grow some very old-fashioned varieties. If you can grow a, a, um, a Cherokee, an old-fashioned Cherokee purple and do it well without splitting, you know, you're getting your water right, you're getting your fertilization right, then you know how to grow heirloom tomatoes. And we have some of those in our house. So it's a combination of variety. I, I really like Marnero. Okay. I, I don't really like Marbone. Uh, we grow some Margold. We do um, uh, German Stripey, which is basically the old fashioned variety of Margold, but pretty much a handful of um, old fashioned varieties and heirloom crosses, everything for flavor. 
Okay, where people are, are not looking for that grocery store tomato that looks like a tomato but has no taste. Okay, they're looking for that experience they had with grandma's garden or great grandma's garden where you go out and you pick that vine ripened fresh tomato. And that's what we're after. That's what we're, we're trying to give them that experience because, again, that's the introduction to them being a customer and also having a health change or a health experience where they're not just tasting something amazing. They're actually feeling better by eating real food. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, there's, there's more questions here, but it is two 30. I think it's, it's um, been a wonderful time. And I just want to thank Thank all three of you, Joel, Zach, and Steve, for, for joining us today. It's been wonderful, and I, I am privileged. I feel very privileged to um, have this connection with you and all of our audience who is growing food. You really, truly um, are doing a great thing when you produce real food, food as medicine, food that will make a difference in people's lives. Um, so thank you very much for being here and thank you for all that you do in making this world a better place. I wish you all the best as you evaluate this year's data and plan for next year. Y'all have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.